I'm Stephen Schulhofer. Uh, I happen to be a, a board member at the Brennan Center for Justice, but I'm here actually as a faculty member at NYU to welcome you all and to thank the Brennan Center uh, for organizing this uh, terrific event. Uh, we're very it's lucky to have uh, uh, the two authors, Matt Apuzzo and Adam Goldman, uh, and Don Borelli to discuss uh, NYPD uh, counterterrorism surveillance. Um, my role is only to introduce Faiza Patel, who will then introduce the other panelists and moderate. Uh, I was instructed not to uh, introduce the other panelists myself, because that would only leave about two minutes after I run through their various uh, uh, salient, <laughs> most salient accomplishments. We'd only have a minute or two left for questions. So I won't do that, but I did want to refer to one comment about, uh, uh, about uh, Matt Apuzzo and Adam idea. Goldman. Uh, this uh, happens to come from The Guardian. And as if any of you have been following the news lately, you undoubtedly know that the, the Guardian in the UK is no slouch when it comes to investigative reporting and scoops in the national security area. <laughs> but according to the, the Guardian, Apuzo and Goldman are the new Woodward and Bernstein. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> does not get any better than that. <laughs> so um, I, I am simply going to, <clears throat> again, thank the Brennan Center for uh, setting up this very, very important event. Uh, FISA will tell you a little bit about the importance of the reporting that Apuzo and Goldman have done, not only in raising public consciousness, but also in contributing to very, very real important changes uh, in the uh, structure of the NYPD. Uh, so I just want to introduce Faiza Patel. She's the uh, co-director of the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brennan Center. Uh, she graduated from Harvard College and uh, here at NYU Law School. After that, she clerked for a judge on the uh, ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Uh, and she practiced law with Debevoys and Plimpton. Uh, she also, uh, in addition to being uh, the co-director of this program at, NY at the Brennan Center, she's, uh, as I understand it, currently a member of the UN Human Rights Council's working group on the use of mercenaries. Um, She's been published very widely in the news media and also in academic journals. Uh, very few of us can claim to, to have done both, uh, but she has quite a few important articles in academic journals in the field of international law. One uh, item on her resume that's not mentioned in your program, but I discovered it through, I never do introductions without Googling the person. And uh, I found out uh, something I didn't know. I've known FISA for several years. And I found out that before coming to the Brennan Center, she was a senior policy officer at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in The Hague. Uh, so she's also contributed to several books, uh, including a leading treatise published by the United Nations on the Chemical Weapons Convention. So she's a person who manages to <laughs> put her, find herself right in the center of, of the action in, in many, many ways. So it's a great pleasure to uh, turn the program over to Faiza Patel. Thank you. Super. Thank you, Steve. And thank you all for turning out today. Uh, I guess it's a pretty good book, huh? <laughs> uh, so uh, Matt and Adam, who wrote Enemies Within, Great book. If you haven't bought it yet, right there. Uh, and they're going to be signing it after the, the program is over. Uh, broke one of the most important stories uh, of the last decade, which was the story about the NYPD's Muslim surveillance program. Now, the Brennan Center had been working with Muslim communities for several years before these stories broke. And we had heard anecdotes about the feeling that many people in the community had that they were being surveilled, that there were informants in their mosques or in their cafes. But there was never really an understanding of the full extent of that program. And the story really changed the dynamic around that issue, um, because we finally saw how broad-based and how uh, 
unsubstantiated much of what the NYPD was doing. And that has led to a lot of changes uh, and will possibly lead to more changes. Uh, two things. Uh, one is that um, the city council recently passed a bill to establish an inspector general for the NYPD to bring some of these programs under greater oversight and control. <clears throat> The second is it revived a very old case, the Hanshu case, and the plaintiff from the Hanshu case, Barbara, is here today, as are all of her lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great tea. Uh, the Hanshu case, for those of you who don't know, is a sort of 1970s uh, era political spying case, which had the settlement in that case had set out the guidelines by which the NYPD could investigate political activity, uh, and these were modified after 9-11 in order to remove almost all of the constraints, although not all, uh, on the NYPD, and that case has been revived now uh, in light of the revelations uh, from Adam and Matt. Um, and of course, we know that there are two lawsuits pending, one in New Jersey and one here in the Eastern District of New York, which are based uh, in great part on these discoveries. So. In addition to winning a Pulitzer Prize for your reporting, uh, you guys really you know, made a change, and that's really, really impressive. <clears throat> now, John Borelli, who is sitting in the middle over there, uh, is, and is this, not an author. <laughs> and is not an author, but he's something even more special. He's a former FBI agent, and you know, we love having them on panels so we can ask them easy questions. Um, <laughs> but Don is now the, the chief operating officer uh, of the Sufan Group, which is an international uh, consulting company on security issues. But before that, he worked at the FBI for 25 years, and uh, he was uh, <clears throat> the assistant special agent in charge of the Joint Terrorism Task Force here in New York, and played a big role in the Zazi case. Now, Zazi is a case we're going to talk about in a little bit, and it was the subway bomber uh, case, uh, which the FBI broke with some assistance, I guess, from the NYPD, and we'll be talking about that in a bit. So he knows from the inside how you deal with a terrorist threat. And so I think all together we have a fabulous panel to discuss. So I'm going to start right in and ask you, Adam, so what led you to write this book? And can you tell me a little bit about what you found out about the NYPD that you thought was surprising? Well, let me back up and uh, <clears throat> provide you some context on why we started on this to begin with. And this dates back to uh, late 2010. Matt and I are on the national, we're on the investigative team in Washington, D.C., and we cover national security, specifically the CIA and FBI. We did not cover the NYPD. Um, and while we were reporting on stories in in DC, we heard from people in the intelligence community terms we had never heard before. Moss crawlers, rakers, a demographics unit. And Matt and I thought that was, those, we'd never heard those terms before. And we're, we're pretty familiar with the terminology and the jargon in the intelligence community. And so that piqued our interest and we, and we started reporting. And uh, as I like to say, we started gathering acorns. And eventually we filled a, a bag full of acorns and realized, hey, I think we can publish a story. So we published a story about what we found the NYPD was doing. Um, and we didn't really, I, I don't think we'd expected to write another story. In fact, when the story came out in August 2011, I was in Pakistan. I was doing a, another story. Matt was left to, <laughs> to his devices in, in, in DC to, to handle any write throughs or follow ups. But then people started leaking us documents, primarily because the NYPD had um, told the public that our reporting was fiction. But people within the NYPD leaked us their secret documents, proving what we had reported was in fact true. Not that, not that we had any doubt, we knew. And uh, we wrote many, many stories based on these secret documents. And at the end of this process in 2012, Matt and I thought, wouldn't it be great if we, we put it all together in a book? Um, and uh, we thought about the perfect way to write this book. And, and, and the best way to write this book, we, we realized as we were reporting, because now we had the NYPD secret documents. We knew where they were. We knew what mosques they were in. We knew what hookah bars they were in. We knew, we knew what they had missed. 
and we thought the Najibul Azazi case was a, a great example um, of, of, of what they had missed. And we could tell the story of the rise of the NYPD through this case of this particular uh, young man from Flushing, Queens, who went off to Pakistan and uh, decided to become a suicide bomber. While we were writing the book, um, we came across more documents. And um, we, we, it provided us a more holistic understanding of what the NYPD was doing in, in New York City. Things we hadn't realized when we were writing these stories for the Associated Press. And one of the things that, that stuck out and really struck me um, after somebody provided us documents is that they were treating MAS as terrorism organizations. And um, we were able to see the predicate that they base these investigations on. And in some cases, it was, as Mike Powell wrote uh, in the New York Times, read thin. Um, and we wondered how, how a police department could designate a mosque as a terrorism enterprise and never bring a terrorism enterprise case. And um, that was probably one of the most surprising things in the book. In the end, um, we thought that the book would be a great vehicle to really uh, uh, let New Yorkers know. we we'll really raise the profile of the reporting we had done because um, we, we thought this is important and New Yorkers, New Yorkers should know what their, let me, let me state this, their municipal police department is doing an organization that is bigger than the FBI, an organization that sends detectives to LA, to Boston, to Pennsylvania, to New Orleans. It mounts missions overseas, and we felt that people would be served by knowing what this organization does, an organization that in many ways is, is, is quite secret, um, and they expect you to trust them. and don't ask any questions. So we're, in the end, we're hoping that the book um, raises awareness about what this police department is doing. So speaking of the police department, Matt, how do they respond <clears throat> to your reporting, and how have they responded to the book? Yeah, we spy on Muslims. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's like literally it. Um, uh, no, I mean, no, seriously, the, the joke is, is the truth. Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> the weird thing that has been for us is that they keep moving the goalposts. So we were, originally we reported on this unit called the Demographics Unit. It was kind of like the subject of our first story. And what the Demographics Unit does is it's this plainclothes team of guys, and uh, typically of Arab and South Asian descent. And they just head out into neighborhoods, and they just hang out all day and they keep tabs on what they hear. So they'll sit in a cafe and they'll write down that, you know, I, Pakistani male owns this place. The clientele appears devout in their attire. Um, I saw a guy walk in with a Koran, or I saw two Korans. Um, they were watching Al Jazeera, or they weren't watching <laughs> Al Jazeera, or we heard the two guys talking about international affairs. We hear about what they think about drone strikes. Uh, we write down, uh, they were talking about the State of the Union address, and they just build files on this. This is just all they do all day is just build files. There's files on where Muslims eat, where they pray, where they shop, uh, where they get their hair cut. Uh, we went and visited at what the NYPD calls a known Moroccan barbershop. Um, <laughs> now, now that's an indie band name. Um, <laughs> we, went, uh, we went to... Um, the, the travel agencies, where, where do Arabs and South Asians watch cricket? Where do they watch soccer? So all these files, this is what they build. So when we found out about this, the NYPD says, nope, there's no such thing as a demographics unit. There's never been a demographics unit, and somebody has an active imagination. So then we proved <clears throat> that there was a demographics unit, and they said, well, yeah, yeah, there's a demographics unit, but we only follow leads. And so then we said, okay, well, what are the leads for this? What are the leads for this? What are the leads for this? And whatever happened to all these leads? No, 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 they don't follow leads. Their job is to generate leads. They generate leads to build cases. And so then we say, okay, fine. Well, what are the leads that, that got generated from this? Like, no, 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 they're not supposed to generate leads. That's not their job. Their job isn't supposed to generate leads. Their job is just to know the community. So 
it seems like every time we get a little bit closer to what we think might be an answer, they just sort of move a little bit farther away. Um, which isn't to say, frankly, that you know we've we've come down one way or the other on whether this is uh, whether this is legal or not. Um, that'll be up to a judge, I guess. Uh, to us, it's just been like, if you can't have an honest discussion with the police department about what they're doing, you know, how do we know it works? You know, how do we know it? How do we know it works? And how do we know whether we accept it as a people? As part of your reporting, I think you also went out and talked to uh, a lot of people in the community uh, where the spying was going on. What were their reactions? Um, it's a mixture. I mean, some were outraged. Uh, some were completely fine with it. We're not doing anything wrong. We don't want any trouble. Uh, the guy at the known Moroccan barber shop said, uh, no, this is OK. In Morocco, the police just come and take you away. Um, I know, right? It's this weird, sick gallows humor, right? Hey, they're not disappearing us in Queens. Um, uh, yeah, it's funny until you're like, wow, that's, that's here. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but so yeah, there's a real mixture. A lot of people, Adam and I spent a lot of time in Newark uh, when we found out the demographics unit went to Newark. And a lot of people were like, this is fine. You know what? They let them come. We're not doing anything wrong. This is totally fine. And then a lot of people just were like, Hey, I'm an American. Why is the why are the police just hanging out keeping files on me? So, just like shocker, Muslims like everybody else feel differently about issues, right? So, mm -hmm. um. so Don, let me ask you a question. Um, the book talks a lot about the Zazi case. It in fact almost uses it to frame the issue. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Zazi case? How did you find out uh, about the plot? Was it really the NSA? And which <laughs> surveillance program was it exactly? Yeah, tell, um, us, tell us exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I, I will be happy to talk about that. But I, I want to, if I can, take a step back. Because the, the, the authors of the book here are talking about the NYPD, right? But essentially. There are, there are two NYPDs in the world of counterterrorism, and so I, I think it's important to make that distinction. The book talks about the mm -hmm. NYPD Intelligence Division in terms of some of the things that they were doing. But the JTTF has somewhere in the neighborhood- Tell us what the JTTF is. The Joint is. Terrorism Task Force Which in, is? in New York. This is a combined um, entity with, right when I left, close to 50 participating agencies that all come to work together that have a common goal of, of you know, finding potential terrorists, working on cases, thwarting plots. And you know, the, the word seamless gets used a lot. And, and for the most part, I honestly say it's pretty seamless. These NYPD detectives have the same computer systems that the FBI agents have. They have access to uh, all of the same classified information. They have security clearances. They're given, you know, uh, the vehicles to drive. They're giving, given all the tools to do their job. They come to work. They work in the same place. They go out, and some of these detectives are the most seasoned detectives that the NYPD has, and they're and they're excellent. So I don't want that to get confused in mm -hmm. the discussion here, talking about well, the FBI's, you know, does good things. The NYPD, you know, they're they're off the reservation doing their own thing. That is not true. In, under the auspices of the Joint Terrorism Task Force. This is a model that works well around the country, and it's, it was started here in New York. New York is the, the basis of every model that's, that's, you know, now in the United States, there's 50-something Joint Terrorism Task we're, we're, Force. We're talking about NYPD intelligence, right. which yeah. is a separate entity. That's so, a good point. So to, to be clear, the FBI has a great working relationship with the NYPD, at least in terms of the the JTTF. So I think that's important as we discuss this to make that distinction because I know that they're some of the finest officers that we work with. So now, having said that, we can move on to Zazi. Let's move on to Zazi. Okay. <laughs> so um, the information, the, the, the nugget of information that started the Zazi investigation came through the intelligence community. It was an intercepted email uh, from I, uh, the guys had reported in the book, an email in Pakistan to Najibullah Zazi. And essentially, it was clear from the email that, that he was involved in some sort of a bomb-making plot. It wasn't overly 
uh, cryptic. There are words like the wedding and the G and things that the G is like a uh, like a, a, a Crisco-like substance that they use to make cakes and things. But these are some of the code words that we've seen okay. in um, bomb Clarified bomb making. Butter. What's that? Clarified butter. Yeah. Clarified butter. Ghee. Yeah. Ghee. Yeah. Okay. okay. I was wondering. Why you... <laughs> Sorry for those of you that use ghee. <laughs> <laughs> So from, from that nugget of information, this is where, you know, the machine, the big federal machine gets started. You, you, you identify the person at the other end of the email that's Najee Bulazazi. Then from there, you, you, you learn everything you can about this individual, including, you know, his travel plans. Uh, at, that, at that point, uh, FISA uh, coverage is going up on his email and his telephones. That was started in Denver. Denver, of course, was the original um, uh, hub of the investigation until Najibullah Zazi was moving to New York. But then the, through the, analy and the analysts found that there were other co-conspirators in New York, uh, uh, Zareen Ahmadzai and Adis Madujanin, and, and we found that they actually traveled at the same time mm -hmm. to Afghanistan. So this was kind of the, um, the, 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 the initial findings of this plot. And based on that, we knew that we had a, a, a real life kind of tier one terrorist organization with an ongoing plot. Do you think this is the most serious threat we faced? I do. I, I think this, this would have been absolutely, absolutely devastating if, if, if the <clears throat> plot were not thwarted and they were able to bomb the, the subway system, we would have had hundreds or thousands of lives uh, lost. And, and you know, I've told a lot of the guys that I work with you know, and obviously I'm just, I'm one character in the book and there was hundreds of, of people doing a fantastic job under a stressful situation. But it's one of the things that I'm most proud of in my 25 years, I believe we saved a lot of lives in those few days. And, and, they, and they made a bomb. I mean, let's not forget, like this wasn't two Sting. dimwits talking about, you know, right. and then the, the informant shows them was like, would you like to buy some rocket launchers? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, they made the bomb. They yeah. had the bomb. They were no joke. So. Now, the NYPD, as, as we know from the excellent reporting of Matt and Adam, is everywhere. Uh, they're in the mosque, they're in the cafes, they're in the hookah bars. So how come they didn't catch on to Zazi? Yeah, that's for you, Don. Oh, no, Adam. Oh, oh, do you guys want to answer it? Uh, well, see, I'll, I will oh, answer it for Don. Because, okay. <laughs> because believe it or not, you know, many of the people in the Bureau aren't aware of what the NYPD Intelligence Division is doing, and, and I would say Don is, is one of them. And they do that for a reason. They keep it pretty close hold. Because mm -hmm. you imagine if it got out, right? Imagine what people might think. What if people wrote stories about it and they wrote a book about it, right? <laughs> so um, uh, why did they miss Zazi? Well, let's see. They were in Zazi's mosque. It was called Abu Bakr and primarily an Afghan mosque in Queens. They had an informant in the mosque. They had an undercover in the mosque. One of the imams in the mosque they had recruited and turned into a cooperative. That's an unpaid informant. They had infiltrated one of the co-conspirators Muslim Student Association at Queens College. They had even um, gone to the travel agency where he bought tickets to Prashara in missed him there. Um, they had gone to the restaurants in his neighborhood. They had been in the YMCA in Flushing. And at every single point along the way, they miss Zazi and his two friends. Why did they miss them? Uh, you know, I, I, can't, I, I can't give you a good answer. But when it mattered most, when it mattered most to New York City, they miss these guys. And that's what this intelligence division, this, this security apparatus was built to, to do. It was built to stop an attack, a real deal Al Qaeda attack. These three guys who had gone off to Pakistan, had been recruited by Al Qaeda, were gonna come back, they were gonna strap suicide vests on their belts, they were gonna blow up the three, four, and five during rush hour while the trains were in the tunnels. You imagine how many people that would have killed? Think of the metal shards from the subway, the plastic from the seats, uh, the smoke, the fire. And they, they, they missed them. And, and, you know, I've never gotten a, I don't think I've ever gotten a real good reason why, why, they, why they missed them. But um, New Yorkers never knew that either, right? New Yorkers never knew that either. Oh. Yeah, there's a, 
there's a scene in the book where um, a very senior CIA officer gets a briefing from the NYPD on the, the demographics unit, they, these guys who are out in the neighborhoods. Um, and, uh, and she's listening, and just by, by happenstance, this happens to be one of the CIA officers um, uh, named Margaret Hennick, who was one of the, the real CIA skeptics on the informant who helped take us to Iraq. His Curveball. name was Curveball. Um, so she was one of the real skeptics. She had a reputation in the CIA of being a skeptic, and she got a reading a readout on the NYPD's programs. And she says, you know, this is like if a foreign intelligence service was trying to figure out who was working for the CIA, and they decided to just hang out in all the Starbucks in Northern Virginia. <laughs> it's like, it's just not an efficient way to do it. Um, you know, you now, and she leaves the meeting saying, look, you now know where the Muslims are, but that doesn't help you find the terrorists. Um, so, I mean, you know, she would tell you that that's why it didn't work. It just, by design, it wasn't going to work. Um, I think there is a logic. I mean, there's a, there is a logic to what they were trying to do, right? They were looking for all the similarities between the profiles of the 9-11 hijackers and figuring, geez, you know, there was somebody interviewed in the LA Times who said, you know, oh, uh, Mohammed Atta, you know, shaved his beard, and we noticed that at the at the cafe. Well, geez, if we were in the cafe, maybe we would notice it too. I mean, so you can see why. I mean, this was not a. This didn't come from a place of evil. This came from a place of wanting to, wanting to find that thing and be there to stop the next attack. They, they looked out into the boroughs and they saw these Muslim communities after 9/11, and it it scared the sh it scared the shit out of them. And you know, one of the examples they looked at was Richard Reed. He was a shoe bomber. And uh, he's the guy who tried to blow up the plane. And, you know, he had the bomb. You know, he had the, the bomb in his shoe, and it, it didn't. It didn't work. But when the French went back and investigated Richard Reed, they found he existed in these commu this this community in in Paris that really French were unaware of. This sort of sprawling Muslim community with its own internet cafes and its own its own ecosystem, essentially that they were completely unaware of. And and the people running the intelligence division, this guy Dave Cohen, you know, he looked at that and he said, "Well, what's in our communities, right? We got to know what's in our communities." And you know, you can't. And Matt and I have been clear about this. You can't fault Ray Kelly for wanting to do more after 9-11. I don't think anybody can fault Ray Kelly for wanting to do more and wanting to keep your city safe. We, we are merely discussing the tactics in which he used to keep the city safe. And um, for us as reporters, it comes down to did these tactics work? Because let's remember, when the, federal government, when the federal government misses a plot, whoa, right? There are congressional hearings. I mean, if Zazie had gone off, this guy, he would have been hauled before Congress and asked to explain why the FBI failed. True so <laughs> let, let, let's talk to this guy for a bit. Hauled this so, guy before Congress. <laughs> yeah, get him before Congress. So, John, why, what do you think? I mean, why do you think that the NYPD, which has a lot of eyes and ears on the ground, I think we can all acknowledge that, uh, missed Zazie? I'm not sure why they missed him, and I'll say that, you know, no matter how many informants you have, no matter, you know, how thorough you are, uh, it's, it's a very daunting task. I mean, the, as the old saying goes, that, you know, the law enforcement has to be right every time. The, the terrorists only have to be right once. Uh, I think the way they, they have gone about doing it is, is different than how the FBI would have gone about doing it. In other words, the FBI wants to know the same type of information that the intelligence division wants to know. Kind of where are the different people, you know, what, what, you know where could potentially a plot evolve from? But, but that's, you, you can't pin that down to a particular, you know, demographic or a, or a mosque or a neighborhood. And the other thing is that you have to try to, if you're, if you're gonna go out and understand the, the, the makeup of a neighborhood, the psyche of the neighborhood, the first thing that you have to really develop is trust, right? So without, with, without trust of the community, all these programs fail. So I think our approach might be a little bit different is that when FBI will go out to a neighborhood, instead of putting somebody in a mosque to listen to Friday lectures for months on end, go out and, and have, hand a business card to, to the local, you know, to the imam or to the barber shop owner and say, listen, can you help us out? And it's a bit more overt, and we try to develop that relationship 
um, in, in a, a least invasive manner. So, so let me follow up with you on that. So what's the difference between the FBI's Domain Awareness Program and the NYPD's Zone Assessment Unit or Demographics Unit? Again, I, I, think, it's, I think it's the invasiveness. Um, How? In, in other words, if, if the FBI is gathering census data to, to use to overlay on a map that's, that's publicly available information that says, okay, this neighborhood is comprised of this, and the FBI is, is developing informants on, a, on an overt basis, like where they know, hi, I'm, I'm Don Borelli, can you tell me about the neighborhood? And let's figure out who's there. If something were, were to happen, would you be in a position to tell us? These type of things versus going from nothing to an undercover operation where you're planting informants and keeping them in moss, you're report, recording license plates that go to every sermon, you're recording the details of every lecture. I think that's different than, than a domain program. Have you, okay. ever opened, have you ever opened a terrorism enterprise investigation on a mosque? Never. So the FBI and NYPD relationship is, is a, a story that all of us love to hear about. Uh, why don't uh, you tell us, from your perspective, Don, what did you think of that relationship? And I'm not talking here about the JTTF, because you've already made very clear that that relationship was very smooth. Um, but when you were in the FBI and you were in the New York, running the New York JTTF, did you know about the Intel Division and what they were doing? Not to the extent that's been reported by Matt and Adam. I mean, we knew that they they had a pretty robust informant program. They, they, you know, we obviously knew that they had a lot of people on the street, um, but to the extent about the, the terrorism enterprise investigations, I had never heard the word mosque crawlers or rakers until I read the book. Mm -hmm. So I did not know. To answer your question about the relationship, um, it's complicated. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's sometimes very strained. Believe it or not, during the Zazi investigation, it probably worked better than, than m m just about any other time. It seems like this is when, w whether you're an intelligence division detective or you're a JTTF detective or you're an FBI agent, when, when shit's about to hit the fan, you mm -hmm. put a lot of these differences together, you roll up your sleeves, you work together. And, that's, and actually, I think the intelligence division and the FBI and the JTTF work, work better there were some hiccups, obviously, that were reported about the, the informant that made the phone call and tipped off. But all those things aside, uh, that, that ran um, more smoothly than times where it's, you know, relatively quiet. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this informant, and let's talk about the role of informants if, a little bit. Maybe uh, I'm going to ask, let's start with you. W what did you see about informants when you went out and did this investigation? Well, one of the things, uh, I mean, I can talk about what the NYPD does. So they have a debriefing program. So, and they have 28 countries of, of interest. So if you're from Pakistan or Afghanistan or Egypt, and I think uh, one of the, the countries of interest, uh, ancestry of interest was American black Muslim, right? That American black Muslim was an ancestry of interest. If you're one of these individuals in this city, you jump a turnstile, you get arrested for shoplifting, and you find yourself in lockup or in a precinct, you're gonna get a visit from the NYPD Intelligence Division. And they're gonna come talk to you. And they're gonna ask a lot of questions. Sunni, are you Sunni, are you Shia? What mosque do you pray at? Um, who's your they imam? They got them to stop asking that one. They did, they got them, the, eventually they, they realized they had to stop asking these, these questions. But uh, they find people who are in um, tough spots, right? I mean, these are, you know, somebody who might be arrested for prostitution, who's an Afghan cab driver. And these are documents. I have the documents. I'm, I'm quote, I'm telling you what I've, what I've read. And, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a crime of shame, right? Nobody wants to go home and tell their wife and, you know, hey, I've been arrested for prostitution. Um, and, you know, they, they get them and they turn them into informants and they put them out in the community. And some of these guys, you know, the, the cops would write, um, well, he doesn't really know much, but he'd be good for sitting around at a restaurant. And um, so they put these people on a payroll. Uh, while we were reporting the stories in the book, Matt and I had the opportunity to talk to a young man from Queens who 
was, I guess, had had felt really guilty about what he was doing, and he went up on Facebook and he outed himself as an informant. <laughs> so you know, immediately my uh, you know my contacts in the community you know let me know this guy was out, and um, and uh, and you know he talked to us and he talked about. Um, what he was doing in the community, and one of the methods he was using was create and capture. You know, talk about jihad and then capture it, put, write it down, um, and let and let the NYPD know about it. So they they created a, a small army of informants and they put them out in the community. One of the other things they did, which was um, I. We only we only learned about it. It's, not, it's actually not in the book. Um, somebody leaked me a uh, a document in which they were um, trying to fill intelligence gaps in the community. So if there was a mosque of interest, they would try to put an informant on the mosque board. Is that one? There he is. And they also targeted the boards of, they targeted the board of a, one really prominent Arab American organization, um, this one, to, the, the executive director is Linda Sarsour, and she works closely with de Blasio and other people in, in the city. And that's really astounding, putting people in positions of influence. It really is, because you know who does that? The CIA does that, overseas. And it shouldn't be any surprise maybe to me because the person that Ray Kelly hired to run the intelligence division is a former CIA operative. He ran the clandestine uh, arm for the CIA. Is Matt, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, no, about informants? How, was, how do you perfect. feel that informants in mosques play out? What are people's reactions to going well, into a space like that and being fearful that what they're saying uh, is being heard and recorded? Yeah, I mean, they don't like it. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the, the, thing, the thing that's kind of brilliant about designating a mosque as a terrorism enterprise uh, is that if I'm investigating, you know, if I'm investigating one guy and then I'm going to send an informant in to follow him into the mosque, um, I, I'm only really allowed to write down in my files like what I hear him say and who interacts with him. Um, but if I designate him and the mosque as the target of the investigation, then everybody's fair game. So then I can then I can have the license plate reader out in the parking lot recording the license plates of everybody who shows up, and then I can have the informant write down everything they hear. So if the imam gets up and says, you know, there's a big controversy over the uh, the prophet cartoons uh, in Europe, and uh, you know I don't want I don't want anybody here to be engaged in acts of violence. I think it's important that you, uh, um, that you write your congressman and you let your elected leaders know that we find this unacceptable. That goes in a police file. Now, the only reason that can go in a police file is because the mosque ends up being, right, they were recording that sermon with a hidden microphone and they can put it in a file because they had a TEI in the mosque. Um, so, I mean, it's... And these mosques, these investigations just go on for years and years and years and years. Uh, and, and they obviously, they never go anywhere. Um, so so it, it's, it's a, it was a brilliant maneuver legally, sort of strategy-wise, uh, within three months of, of them getting the legal authority to have TEIs, they went and created a dozen of them. So I mean, it was like literally like, I think in the book, uh, we it's say weeks. it's two weeks two later. Week. It was two weeks. Within two weeks, they have a dozen of these things. They've already identified a dozen terrorism cells, and they're all in mosques. Um, and uh, so they have the authority for two weeks. They start 12 of them. I mean, in the book, we say it's like clearing planes off the runway. It's like finally we have the authority. Just, you know, get, get the informants in. So. Oh, and I'll make one point. Uh, the person who was who made, the person who decided to do this, uh, the Deputy Commissioner for Intelligence, the NYPD, um, of Dave Cohen, the former CIA operative who ran the clandestine arm for the CIA, he told everybody he was going to do it. He told everybody, put in an affidavit, told the Hanshu lawyers, told the judge, guess what? You know what? We got to be able, let's put the First Amendment aside. We need to be able to moss. We need to be able to get into you know, other organizations. And he broadcast this loud and clear. And uh, I mean, it's just a handful of lawyers who, you know, were standing in between him and the judge. And the judge said, 
you know what, you're right. This is, these are perilous times. And Co this guy Cohen painted a frightening picture and the judge, the judge gave him the authority to do that. And, uh, and, 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 and that was it. And he didn't, he didn't hide this. So I have one last question before we turn to audience questions, because there's a lot of people, and I want to make sure everyone gets a chance. NYPD and CIA, what do you think, Don? Is that a relationship made in heaven, or what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it does seem a bit of a, a, an odd relationship, um, given that the CIA works essentially outside of the Constitution, and NYPD um, is obviously supposed to do everything in accordance with the Constitution. Uh, I think there probably are certain areas, such as some training and some things, that there could be a logical overlap, but, but teaching people how to spy without regard to constitutional rights obviously could, could be problematic, and I think the fellows have kind of reported on some of those things in the book. Mm -hmm. And so, since that was a brief answer, uh, I'm going to give one last question, which is oversight. That's obviously something that we at the Brennan Center worry about a lot. Um, in the book, it talks uh, quite a bit about the fact that the NYPD could do whatever it wanted to do in the intel division without anybody from the outside who was independent right. vetting what they were doing. Now, the NYPD has said, well, you know, we may not have any outside vetting, but we have our own vetting process, and you know, we have all these lawyers looking at it, and we have, uh, you know, the district attorneys and the U.S. attorneys and the internal affairs, and everybody is actually providing us with right. oversight. Right. What was your impression? Well, um, well, there's no essentially no outside oversight. So the NYPD operates. The intelligence division has never been audited. Uh, it's since it was re reinvented in 2002. Um, city Council has funded it every year and has never held a hearing on what they do. Um, Congress funds it and doesn't know what they do. The Homeland Security Department has, and the Department of Justice have provided something like $2 billion to the NYPD and says they have no ability to understand what the NYPD Intelligence Division does. Um, the Intelligence Division has told a federal judge that it's, it's very organizational chart is too sensitive to release. Um, it has invented a new stamp called NYPD secret that looks just like real secret, um, but it, it holds the force of law kind of like no girls allowed, like outside the treehouse. Right? <laughs> the treehouse, the treehouse, like, no girls allowed. Yeah, with, with a Z, <laughs> no girls allowed. Uh, it holds that force of law. Um, they regularly ignore Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, uh, you know. The, you can't get a police report in this city. Does anybody here know what the shack is? The shack, okay, the shack is the press office where they keep the reporters uh, at the police department. You know, you, you can't get a police report. The NYPD will tell you what's newsworthy. They type it up, they call them the sheets. They tell you, here, here reporters, here's what's news. You can't get a police report. You can't get a 911 tape. You can't get a, all those video cameras all through the city. You can't get it, you know. There was a shooting in Times Square. There's 30,000 cameras with video of that. You, we're not gonna get that. Um, we can't get mug shots. Uh, you know, they have a little phone that sits on all the reporters' desks, and when they wanna give you news, they pick up the phone and all the reporters' phones ring, and they tell you, you know, anonymously what the hell's going on. Um, this is not oversight, right? I mean, this is not oversight at all. And, uh, you know, our deal is, is like, you know, to wax constitutional here for a minute. Um, it's this whole surveillance thing, and we're seeing this in, in Washington with the NSA. It, it may all, people may be fine with it, and, and that's fine, but it's, there's a social contract that we give with our government, right? We give them the authority, we give guys like Don the authority to arrest us and, you know, get emergency wiretaps and search our homes and, you know, put us on watch lists. We give them that authority, right? And in exchange, we trust that they're gonna keep us safe, right? But if you don't know what you're giving up and you don't know what you're getting in return, then there is no social contract. Right? And so that's the debate that we are having right now. It's not the question of do we approve of it, do we not approve of it, because we passed the Patriot Act. We passed the FISA amendments. There was a revised Hanshu agreement. We knew what we were kind of doing 
but we didn't know how it was going to be used. And the social contract requires us to know what we're giving up and know what we're getting in return. So to the extent we provided this, the tiniest little bit of oversight, then we feel like, as reporters, we did our job. Okay. Okay, so we have a lot of people here uh, who I think have questions. We have two roving mics, so please hang on, and I'm going to call you guys in turn. So over here, please. And, and I'm just going to say, uh, sorry, just a few rules of the game. Uh, please uh, tell us your name and your affiliation if you have one. Please keep it brief, because there's a lot of people and a lot of questions. Thank you. Okay, my name is Richard Barr, and this is a, a two-part. The first part is just factual. Um, did the uh, uh, intelligence uh, division exist before the Bloomberg-Kelly uh, era? Did the uh, uh, demographics unit ex exist before the Bloomberg-Kelly era, at least in the, their current form? And is the, uh, is the demographics unit part of the intelligence division? Yes, the demographics unit existed uh, before Bloomberg, but it was essentially a glorified... No, the, the, intel no, intel intel the intel division, intel. yeah, the intel division did. Um, and after 9-11, um, Kelly decided he was going to revamp it. And that's why he went to uh, the judge in the Hanshoe case and said he needed these particular uh, authorities to, to do that. The demographics unit is the creation of Dave Cohen, um, who is the deputy commissioner for intelligence and runs the intelligence division, and another man who we write out in our book named Larry Sanchez. And Larry Sanchez, um, was brought over from the CIA while on CIA payroll as former CIA director uh, George Tenet's um, personal liaison to the city to, to help the NYPD. And together, they built this demographics unit. So, so the rest of it is, given um, how institutionalized it's become in these Bloomberg-Kelly years, what do you think the possibility is that a new mayor, new police commissioner, uh, might be might feel free to disband one or both of them. I, I really don't know. I mean, um, when we were writing our stories uh, in 2011 and 12, there were polls done. New Yorkers were like, "Great, this is fantastic. Keep doing it." I mean, Ray Kelly as himself has boasted to the Wall Street Journal that nothing has changed. Um, you know, it's really. It's really a question for New Yorkers to decide, come in this mayoral race. Is this the way they want to continue as a city? De Blasio says he's going to review the intelligence division, but what does that mean? That means nothing. Um, and Loda is you know, out there saying, ah, I'm, I'm hard on terrorism. Well, who isn't? But, you know, <laughs> uh, so, you know, we just, we just can't know. So there's a question right here. I'm going to move to the back in just a minute, okay? Um, I just have a question. Can you, can you uh, this tell us your name? Uh, Timothy Lunsford, National Lawyers Guild. And I wanted to find out, on Saturday, the Supreme Court justice led by Justice Roberts and Alito, uh, five to four, passed that we no longer have a Fifth Amendment, meaning that when you're arrested, the Miranda rights don't have to be read anymore. It's now turned to a privilege. If you're educated about the Miranda rights, you can say, I want a lawyer, or you can say, I understand I need a lawyer. But if you're not, you're uneducated, or you're a foreign national, or something like that, you can't. The NYPD can use this now to pick up about anyone and hold you without an attorney. And I want to find out how our Supreme Court is now part of this whole thing with stuff we don't know that's happening. Because this was passed back I, in September. Yeah, I, um, we haven't seen any sort of connection to the Supreme Court ruling. And I will plead ignorance that Adam and I have been living in an absolute bubble on this. So. I, I have not read this, so I, I just don't feel, I don't feel comfortable. Yeah, I don't weighing. think we're yeah. educated yeah. enough to answer yeah. that question. I'm not educated yeah. enough. Uh, but there are many lawyers in this room. Yeah, I'm sure I you can find that. a lawyer. I, I see, see them there. They're Talk here. Talk to that, the lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Bill DiPaolo, and um, in the book you talked about actually me being spied on. The group is Time's Up. It's an environmental organization in New York City. So. Um, I guess my question, and then that led to the David Powell story, which was pretty awesome, actually. I was really nervous <laughs> about doing that story because I knew exactly. that the city would have to make up a reason why I'm a terrorist, and they um, connected me with some bicycle bomber. I think you know about that. <laughs> so I guess the question is, um, being spied on is something a lot of environmentalists know about, but the infiltration part, where people are inside the group 
then people are kind of like making up rumors and divisionary stuff and creating violence. Did you guys find out anything about that kind of thing and whether that was happening? Yeah, I mean, you know, the whole uh, agent provocateur thing, we, I'll be honest, we never found any evidence of that at the NYPD. Um, I mean, it's not true. We spent a little time on it. Um, but, uh, I mean, for the most part, the infiltration was just purely intelligence gathering. I mean, you can see the, you can see the reports. You know, the guy who went to, the undercover officer who went to New Orleans and uh, spent time uh, at the People's Summit in New Orleans and kept files on, or, you know, kept a report on all the people he met, the woman who was trying to organize nannies in New York City and the guy who thought Palestinians were getting a raw deal from the Israelis and uh, the guy who wrote a, a, new, a, a liberal newsletter. I mean, so it, I haven't, we never saw any evidence of, you know, sort of like the, you know, the typical, like, let's start something and then when the police come, we arrest everybody. It doesn't mean it didn't happen, but you know, we don't we don't get into that in our book. So I'm going to do one more back there, please. And then this side is really quiet. What's going on? Yeah, come on, <laughs> left side, let's go. Well, whenever we we discuss these issues, uh, what always puzzles me is that after 9/11 occurred, Americans never asked why. Uh, and the consequence of that is that we went to war with all of Islam. The people who have tried to blow up bombs, like that Nigerian kid who tried to blow up his underwear and the shoe bomber and uh, this uh, Najib Bull guy, um, it seems that most of them were insulted, have been insulted, and they're responding to being insulted. Um, uh, th th that's why everything they did was so inept. Um, and I, I, I don't understand how we can just uh, ac accept that we can go after a people as, as being evil and looking for ways to get them somehow without ever listening to them. Uh, and my, my, my concern is, I, I, I just skimmed your book briefly uh, when I came in here, but I don't think you speak to that. Um, you know, you just talk about the, the ineptitude of the New York City Police Department, uh, but you don't speak to the, the motivation that underlies all of this and whether there's any justification to that motivation. That, 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 that was, that was a, a, a great question and also a very timely question, and um, I'd like to take that if you sure. don't mind. So we agree with you, we being many, many people in the community and, and our company in particular, one of the things that, that we have been doing as, as a company is looking at some of the research, you know, doing research project, looking at these, the narratives and the causative factors that drive these young men and women into a life of terrorism. And it, it includes things like what's going on at the local level, what kind of, what's the message that they're hearing from the bad guys as well as the good guys. In fact, this last week, we had a conference that was hosted in four cities around the world simultaneously where we discussed these issues. And I think um, and, and the, the CEO of our company, Ali Soufan, actually wrote an op-ed about this uh, last week saying, this is actually the missing uh, tool in the toolbox, or maybe not missing, but it's, it's, it's at the bottom, kind of, kind of buried uh, uh, underneath all of the other tactical things like the surveillance and, and, the, and the different things we're doing. I think this is starting to get traction now, at least I hope it is, that we realize that we cannot bomb our way to a life of, of freedom and security, that we're going to have to look at the, the narratives and the causative factors and open up that dialogue and have a better understanding of what brought us to where we are today. And we're actively, our, our company and many other organizations are working to do that. Thank you. Uh, here. My name's Hino Shamsi, and, and Mr. Borelli, I have a couple of questions for you. Can you hear me now? Am I not, I'm not allowed to have two in a row, am I? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, one, which I wasn't going to ask, but now I'm fascinated about this study that you're doing, is, um, you know, one of the problems with the analytical framework of what the NYPD did was with its radicalization report and its radicalization narrative that seemed to ascribe patterns of behavior on, based on people being Muslim that 
millions of people, Muslim and non-Muslims, go through without ever engaging in any kind of wrongdoing whatsoever. And so there's a lot of debunking that's been done about the methodology. And I'm curious about how the study that you're doing would avoid the kinds of methodological failures that have had a devastating effect on so many people. My second shorter question is, um, I'd like you to please expand on your answer to FISA about the difference between what the FBI is doing and what the NYPD has been doing. Because the NYPD certainly has said in its own defense that it's only doing what the FBI is doing with respect to mapping. And there's certainly uh, FBI undercover and informant authority um, under the new rules put in place post 9-11. So could you just expand a little bit about what is the difference? Is it a difference of scope? Is it a difference of extents? Um, what is the difference between what the FBI can do and what the NYPD, in your opinion, did wrong? Okay, well, to clarify, when you say FISA, the, the NYPD... FISA. No, no, the, oh, me. Uh, oh, uh, oh, I'm thinking, FISA. I'm thinking of wiretapping FISA. I'm thinking, <laughs> I know they'd love to have FISA authority, but to my knowledge, they don't have it yet. Um, the, the FBI's levels of authority, and they're actually, they're, they're, you can read them on the internet, there's several levels of investigative authority that the FBI has. They have an, assess, a, an assessment, a preliminary investigation, and a full investigation. And, it, and it's kind of a continuum of least invasive to most invasive. And as you get a nugget of information, for example, on an, on an assessment, you have a limited amount of time if it starts with 30 days, it can get an extension, and, th and there are certain uh, things that you can do. You can check out leads, you can query informants, you can um, get uh, telephone subscriber information, and there's a whole list of things. I used to know them all by memory. But, but in essence, you know, once you've exhausted all those, you have to close the case. If you remember, there was a lot of criticism when we had the Boston bombing because the FBI opened an investigation they went through the whole, you know, uh, the, the, the menu of investigative authorities, including interviewing the family, and then found nothing, had to close the investigation. Subsequently criticized because it turns out it was a, it was a bad guy. But according to the FBI's legal authorities, that's what they could do, all right? Where, so that's, that's one of the differences. It's, it's, it's a very kind of regimented level of authorities and timelines that go with that, as opposed to for example, putting informants in every mosque for months or years, recording um, every sermon, recording every license plate, the FBI absolutely can't do that. We don't. And, and the FBI gets inspected every several years. Each field office, there comes in an, an inspection team to basically open those files. And if it found that we were doing something like that, um, pe pe people would have been, you know, called to task on it. So it's, I think, the FBI's rules and regulations are much, much stricter, and th there's a lot of oversight. Um, your second question about the report, the, the, the study. Um, our study didn't look just at Islamic terrorism. We looked at right-wing terrorism. We looked at the IRA issue. We looked at violence. We didn't look at just Islam. We looked at what caused people to turn violent, whether it was because of a right-wing issue, a left-wing issue, a religious issue. I mean, that's why, that's why I think it's, it's not just looking at Islam. It's, and, and kind of, I'm not going to steal the show here. You, you can get the, um, the study is on, I believe, our website, uh, kiosk.org or the Sufan group. You can see me afterwards if you want to get a copy of it. But in essence, it, it wasn't, it, it was more broad uh, based. And, and comprehensive than just looking at a particular s slice of, of the community. Okay, uh, Paul? Yes. Sorry. Um, can, you, can someone get Paul in my Do you have any idea how much has been spent by the intelligence division since 9 11? Um, well, we, For, 43 million that we know of times 12 years, right. 480 million if I do. They're getting um, money. They're also getting f money from the White House and, uh, and HIDA. So. Yeah, high intent. The, this is, the surveillance is partly funded by this drug trafficking program that the White House runs. Um, but then the, white, the Intel division also has this sort of black budget that uh, is funded by um, it's the New, New York City Police Foundation, which is a nonprofit group that is funded largely by uh, 
gigantic companies, uh, Wall Street investment banks and whatnot, and they hold this big gala uh, every year. They make you know millions of dollars, um, and that's been used to send intelligence officers overseas. Um, but if you and we talk about this in the book, for the right price, you can actually you can actually basically create your own NYPD unit. Um, so there was a big concern among the fashion industry that the NYPD wasn't doing enough to investigate knockoff uh, fashion items, you know. And so, but the NYPD is like, hey, we're busy, you know, solving crimes and whatnot. And uh, and so the, if they went to the foundation, and the fashion industry gave, I think, it was three million dollars to the NYPD foundation to create a fashion industry task force uh, that paid for NYPD guys to investigate, you know, knockoff guy. And so people were, you know, getting arrested for doing knockoff stuff down in the village or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, wouldn't it be great if like we could all like, you know, you live in a neighborhood and, you know, people are, you know, selling drugs in your neighborhood and you all get together and go to the foundation and buy like a police unit. So, um, so yeah, so you can't count the foundation money, which is all this sort of black budget that doesn't get audited with this other black budget that doesn't get audited but goes to the city council. So it's hard to, but a lot of money, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. There's a gentleman back there in the red shirt. Thank you. I'm Rob Bowen, Interrelated inter Assessments. My question is this. When you talk in terms of the uh, demographics unit, it sounds eerily similar to the black desk that spied on African organizations in the 60s and 70s, which is similar to the COINTEL program that spied on black organizations in the 60s, which is similar to the spying on the socialists and communists in the 50s and 40s, which is similar to the spying on the anarchists in the 20s. So in short, aren't we a nation that has, a democratic nation that has always been under surveillance? I, I, that's a good point. And we, <laughs> we write about that in the book. We write about how uh, uh, that the NYPD actually had a black desk. An extremist desk. I feel like was in the in the sixties and seventies. In the sixties and seventies, not have that one now. Let's and and actually, the it, it, while we were doing our research for the for the book, we were going back and, and looking at, at stories in the New York Times, and there was a trial uh, in uh, there was a trial in I believe it was two thousand and six, in which these two guys wanted to blow up the 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 Herald Square subway plot. Of course, they never had a bomb. And they were convicted, and during the trial, it came out that the NYPD puts listening posts, listening posts in the community. And I'll give Matt a lot of credit. It was one of the gems he found in his research. This is from the FBI during the 60s and 70s, their ghetto informant program. It's the exact language, the, list, the listening posts. And we know what happened uh, with that. That was uncovered by the church committee. Um, and I, I don't think the get, I don't think the FBI has a ghetto informant program anymore. I do not believe yeah. that. No, they have oversight. I can confirm. <laughs> you can confirm that. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Malcolm Arnold. Um, I was wondering if we have any idea of the number of informants that that have been recruited, and um, Matt, if you can talk a little bit about as far as you say the press can't even get police reports. Can you talk a little bit about the history of that? And then, like, when did this all start as far as that? 9-11. And, and, okay, <laughs> and then also, uh, uh, Mr. Borelli, uh, you talk about um, the CIA and you were with the FBI. The CIA is an intelligence gathering organization, but it is also an operational organization in that they can do operations. Does anybody in the FBI talk about how that the CIA is also has an operational component when it could have not, it could have only been an intelligence gathering organization, that the fact that it is an operational unit creates blowback that then creates more uh, violence upon the shores of the U.S. So it creates a feedback mechanism. I guess I'm not entirely sure how, it, 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 to, to answer your question in terms of, of, you know, how that applies domestically with the NYPD. I mean, essentially, you're right, the, the CIA does have a, oper, an operational program. Um, the, you, you put somebody in, you know, in the command and control at a leadership position with the NYPD, realizing that the CIA um, teach people to 
cheat, lie, and break the law. Um, that doesn't make them bad people, but that's, what, that's their job, right? So, um, and that's all well and good when it's overseas, but when they take those same tactics and say, okay, this is how we do it in you know, some third world country, and this is how you guys should be doing it at home, that's, that's the rub, that uh, you know, it doesn't comport with, with the law. Now again, there's, there's some value added that the, the CIA, in terms of some of their analytic capabilities and training uh, NYPD analysts, for example, how to be, uh, you know, how to connect dots and how to be better analysts and things like that. So that's not to say that there's, there's not a benefit of having relationship with the CIA. But when it becomes the CIA kind of putting together an operational model that they would uh, deploy overseas and, and bringing that to Brooks, Bronklin, Manhattan, whatever, it's obviously going to be a train wreck, you know, uh, at some point. We, and, oh, sorry. No, I was going to answer the question about the media. Um, Look, I mean, we don't, we don't have, Adam and I don't have to deal with that. We, we, we work in Washington. Uh, we got our own media problems which helps, in Washington. right? I mean, we, you know. Um, but look, it's, the media landscape sucks right now, right? I mean, our, we don't know if we have a good business model. Like, the whole industry of journalism is in flux. Um, it's this sort of, it's, you know, I don't know how many minutes there are in a day, but forget 24-7. We are a minute-to-minute -minute news, you know, industry now. Um, uh, you know, and uh, and the NYPD is this massive, you know, organization that creates a lot of news, and you know, a lot of times, you know, you have news organizations that have uh, have younger kids, not kids, younger people uh, reporting on this, um, and all that all that they need is to be the first one to know, like when there's been a shooting or when you know when somebody's been some celebrity's been arrested or or whatever has happened like that's their job that's what they that's what gets them a paycheck um, it's no secret it's no coincidence that the you know the the government builds up a program to make sure those people get that information and make it harder to get other information um, and when you do that uh, it becomes just the incentive to to bite the hand that feeds you it just completely goes away. So, you know, you reporting reporting that that sort of kicks over the apple cart becomes harder to do. And and that's by design. And we don't this isn't just limited to the NYPD. Uh, since 9/11, you know, terrorism and the fear of terrorism has been used to close doors and close books at all levels of government. We just did this after the after the explosion down in Texas and fertilizer plants. It turns out there was a law that everybody in the vicinity of these fertilizer plants is supposed to get notified. But they don't anymore because they're like, oh, if we notify people, they'll know where the stuff is and then the terrorists could get it. So they're like, this law is supposed to keep people safe, but it's in the name of keeping them safe. They're not told that this stuff's in the backyard. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> Here. I'm sorry, I'm going to get to everybody, OK? Um, my name is Diala Shamas, and I'm with the CLEAR Project at CUNY Law School. Um, my question is a little bit more about the sort of fallout of the surveillance program. Your book does a really good job of framing the consequences um, and the follow-up with regards to the city council, you know, the IG bill, and, and from a very political perspective, what happened. But I didn't see as much about the impact of surveillance on the communities. And I know that you have been working with these communities for a very long time now. You've been working with these communities. And I was a little bit surprised by your characterization that some folks were fine with it, and then others had some concern about an informant you know, being in their mosque. And as, as we all know and can imagine, this sort of deep infiltration that we're talking about um, and at issue here is something that has chilling effects on freedom of speech, on religious practice, um, on communities' relationships with the NYPD, and as a result, deprives them of, of protection that you know, the NYPD should be providing. Um, we've also you know, documented this in my own organization, the impact that it has on um, students. Muslim Students Associations were surveilled. So I, I wanted to sort of problematize the response that um, many, you said you received from many folks, which was that we have nothing to hide you know, the NYPD should, you know, is welcome to come in and maybe think that that's actually an illustration of the chilling effect and the fact that communities are now willing to accept a lesser level of protection and a lesser level of rights than others um, as a negative consequence as opposed I, to one of the reactions. Well, listen, I think that uh, there's certainly been a chilling effect in the Muslim community in New York. I've been out there, we've talked to these people. Despite what Ray Kelly says, despite what Ray Kelly says, no, 
his relationship with the Muslim community is at rock bottom. They are very upset about this. People on this Muslim advisory um, committee he's put together have resigned, and Ray Kelly's unapologetic. And, and maybe he shouldn't apologize for anything, but the people in the community feel betrayed. And we've written about this, how they've held up imams um, as partners in the war on terrorism, and these same imams they've held up as you are a good guy, they're spying on, that in the end they don't trust him. Um, and I don't know what kind of message, I mean, well, we know what kind of message that sends to the community. It's just like, no matter what we do, we'll, we'll never be trusted. Um, so there's been a real chilling effect in the community. You know, we, we've also been in New Jersey and reported on the Muslim community there and what the NYPD was doing. And these are really two distinct communities. We found the Muslim community in, in New York to be fragmented. Um, and maybe first generation, second generation. Um, you know, we did a book event in, in Bay Ridge, and you know, a lot of people who came to the book event, they didn't, they didn't speak great English. And you know, I, I'm not so sure that the Muslims in New York are as mobilized or as educated as the Muslims in New Jersey. Because guess what? When we wrote, when we got this story out of New York and we put it in New Jersey, the Muslims there got. They were furious. Well, it, it's two things, right? I mean, it's it's the there's no Muslim community, right? I mean, you have a mm -hmm. Pakistani community, you have a Bangladeshi community, you have an Egyptian community, right? I mean, so the it's share like Lubavitch and Satmar. Right? I mean, it's sort of the uh, yeah. the shared the shared <laughs> the shared religion doesn't necessarily make a you know a community, um, and and what we saw in Newark, frankly, was that uh, a lot of the a lot of the Muslims who were put in demographic files in Newark were African-American converts. And there's just a much more politically established African-American political community in Newark than there is, you know, sort of a Muslim political community in New York City. So um, it's as much about, it's as just much about political experience, political maturity, political organization, as it is about sort of uh, Muslim community, um, because I, I, don't think, I don't think there is one sort of catch-all Muslim community. So right here? Now I'm going to get yelled at. No, 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 no. Not <laughs> <at all. laughs> that would be good. No, actually, I applaud your work. I'm from, uh, my name is Mohammed Al Filali. I'm from the other side of the pond, from New Jersey. Okay. And I'm amongst the very first people who came out and be furious at the very beginning. Um, not uh, born in the United States, an immigrant, but still uh, realized uh, the chilling effect of this spine um, situation. I'm not sure through your investigation if you had made the relationship between some intelligence from foreign intelligence and the CIA and the rise of the Muslim movement throughout the world. And probably anybody could ask this question. The rise of the democratization of many Muslim countries and some um, leaders of the Muslim world, should we say, are opposed to the idea and have professed openly that they will do everything and anything in their power to stop the rise of the Muslim movement in the world, if anybody could speak to that. I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not part of the, part of the book. I mean, I take, obviously take you at, I mean, I've seen the same sort of stories that you've seen, but it's not something that we came across as far as, you know, NYPD goes. Sorry. So the lady in the back in the blue. Done, I've done quite a few interviews with some imams who um, are quite chilled by the surveillance going on. They, um, for instance, could not even be speaking about the chemical weapons in Syria. This could not be anything they could talk about. They can't talk about uh, um, even surveillance because they're worried about being surveilled. My question is, what have you found in the various communities that you've uh, been going to, and also, what about the response and any reaction and any organizations that you've you found to counter what's going on in terms of the surveillance? Have you uh, well, encountered I, any resistance? No, I mean, I, I think in the, in the community itself, or the disparate communities, um, there has been some mobilization um, that, and you haven't, it's amazing, you know, uh, you haven't read about it in any newspapers in New York. Nobody's reported on it, but you know they have organized. They realized, look, the only way anybody's going to listen to us if, is, is we vote, right? Um, you know, we got to get a voice in the city. Um, some, so I'll give you one example of somebody changing their behavior. Um, there are there are a couple of kids 
that the NYPD was spying on, and one of them, uh, one of them talked to me, and he said, they couldn't talk about jihad, right? They couldn't, they couldn't talk, like, I can talk about jihad, right? And I don't think I'm gonna wind up in a police file, okay? But this, you know, it, it's an issue, it's an issue in the communities, people going and radicalizing doing bad things, and they wanna, they, they talk about it, like it's a political discussion. And he said, you know, I, I realized I could no longer, I could no longer say the word jihad in a discussion, so he started calling it you know, gave it a word like dance, like when people go and dance. And then this was this informant who told me this. And he, you know, he realized that it was just a cover for what they wanted to talk about. They weren't interested in going in jihad. But he put that in the police file. He told his handler that, that they were talking about jihad and giving it code names. Um, so there's a real, there's a real effect. There's, sorry, there's someone back there. Yeah, sure, that's sure. all the time, yeah. So just back there, the lady in the white sweater. <laughs> Hello, hi, my name is Salma Rizvi. I'm currently a 1L, but I come from nine years of service in the intelligence community. And uh, my question is um, to Don, precisely, and then one for Adam and um, Matt. But the NSA has a program, it's called the Islamic Cultural Employee Resource Group Program. And it essentially allows 102 right now, they have official members that are able to use duty time, 20% of duty time, to contribute to a larger conversation about what Islamic culture is within the agency. I used to chair the organization for two years as a political appointment. During um, my tenure, I found that it was through this organization that we were able to um, you know, ensure that our leaders were not bringing in speakers that were Islamophobic, and to ensure that our intelligence tactics you know, strictly from a tactical perspective, we're not demographically or racially profiling, despite the fact that all of our targets are foreign intelligence targets. So I thought this was the most effective way of voice fighting from within, essentially, and voicing concerns to leadership. Um, do you feel that the NYPD uh, or FBI would even have leaders su supporting or sponsoring such a collective group of Muslims within their agencies. Um, and then for Adam and Matt, do you feel that uh, if Muslims were in higher numbers as they are at the agency to guard against such discrimination that they could have had a resounding effect on the NYPD and had prevented this from happening? Okay, I'll, I'll take a stab first, uh, and again, I can't speak to the NYPD, but I'll, I'll, I'll discuss uh, from the uh, FBI's perspective. I'm, I'm not familiar if we have a program like that. To be honest with you, when I left, I don't believe there was, but they, that could be, there could be now. Uh, but would they be open and receptive? I, be, I believe so, a absolutely. I think we saw this when some of the Mm -hmm. um, that some of the training that the FBI mm -hmm. actually, there, some of the early 9-11, uh, you know, post 9-11 counterterrorism training that, that were rolled out by people that were so-called experts and it turned out it was, a lot of it was bunk. And once it was brought to light, uh, the FBI realized that it needed to be more in tune with, you know, what the reality is and, and have training that, that matches what, what really is going on with the culture and with what's going on on the street. So that tells me that the FBI is receptive to change, and if change means having a focus group to help kind of guide some of these programs, I think they would be receptive to it. Uh, I just don't know if there's anything in place right now. And with regard to the NYPD, I can't answer what they, um, what they do or don't. You, you know, I, I will say uh, there are a lot of Arab and South Asians mm -hmm. in the NYPD, and, yeah. and that's a, a real, frankly, a real benefit to the NYPD. Um, and for all the time that Adam and I spent talking to people and, and talking about this, we never came across any evidence that, you know, the guys at the top were shooting off Islamophobic, you know, statements or, or making racist remarks. Um, you well, know, this is it. This except is, for the third jihad. Yeah, well, except <laughs> well, for the third no, jihad. Yeah, hand. So what, what, we, what we found as far as the investigation, as far as the investigation's going, we never found any evidence that this was like, you know, they were saying, oh, well, you know, go investigate these guys and making racist remarks. I mean, this was, this was their investigative philosophy as spelled out in, in documents um, and as spelled out in uh, radicalization in the West. 
they weren't really making a secret of where, where they were coming from philosophically. Um, and uh, so I don't think it was an issue of like, oh, there, there aren't enough Muslims at the NYPD or aren't enough South Asians, because there are, there are a lot. And, uh, and I think this, was just, this is just a question of different approaches uh, to policing and, and uh, the way they viewed terrorism, not necessarily the, their philosophy on Muslims. Daisy? <clears throat> Um, thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Adam and Matt. I think it's good that you've written this book. I wish you had written it earlier. Um, I have two babies. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for doing this in your spare time. The, um, I think the, the bigger question is we've never really had a national conversation about the effect of 9-11, a serious national conversation. And nor did we ever have a national conversation about the Patriot Act and its impact. I mean, not so long ago, we saw people lined up with special registration. Uh, there were all kinds of detentions. A very close friend of mine was 35 years old, driving in a BMW, was pulled out, hauled out, was in detention for 60 days. And he had an IT business, which fell apart while he was gone. No questions asked, nothing said. You know, those are the kinds of stories that have been going on. In the Muslim community, I'm a member of that community, communities, is well aware of what's been going on. My question to all of you is, why is it that we have not looked at successful models of um, you know, eliminating extremism or tackling extremism or terrorism that exist in the world? Why aren't we learning from some of the successes that, that, that have proven, uh, you know, proven well? I mean, I was just in Sing Singapore this April, and there were case studies done and case studies shown from Sri Lanka to Singapore to Indonesia to Saudi Arabia, not so good, but still it's working. And um, Jordan, which has an excellent program. Why aren't we learning from the world? Because in all those instances, you will see that the Muslim community is very much part, is collaborating with law enforcement because law enforcement by itself cannot tackle extremism. So, okay, so, can I? so it's the bigger question yeah. really that needs to come up, bubble up. Is to, so, you know. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think that that's a point that uh, Hina also had raised earlier, and I think that, uh, at least from, from where I sit and from how, sorry, I'm exercising moderator's privilege here, from the research that, that we've done at the Brennan Center, I think that our basic conclusion is that it's not really possible to predict who's going to become violent based on their ideology. So that any program that's actually targeting people based on what they believe and what they say is going to be overbroad. And in this country, is probably going to run afoul of our constitutional values. That's actually what the NYPD did. What the NYPD did is say, if you're a devout Muslim, you're likely to become a terrorist. And if you're growing a beard, and you're uh, participating in political activities, and you've given up smoking and drinking, then you're likely to become a terrorist, Damn, and we're going to keep watching you. Now, I've got to be the guy being fair to the NYPD. Jeez. All right. They actually said, <laughs> if you are a terrorist, you are, likely to, you are likely to have been a devout Muslim, right? And, and it is an important distinction, only because this is the NSA debate all over again. In order to, have, in order to find the needle in the haystack, you've got to have a haystack, right? So they're saying, our haystack is, devout Muslims. We recognize not all devout Muslims are terrorists, but they say, but most terrorists are devout Muslims. So they're not saying all, if you are a devout Muslim, you are likely to be a terrorist. They're saying, if you are a terrorist, you are likely to be a devout Muslim. And but, I, but it's the basis of the surveillance program. I mean, that's, you know, it, regardless of which way they're putting it, right, but it is that's important the basis to get of the, the way right. Only be, it, right. I think it is important to say the, the way right. To be fair to the NYPD. To be fair to the NYPD, you're correct, in the sense that they looked at 11 case studies and they said, you know, these 11 guys in different parts of the world were devout Muslims, so we should be looking at devout Muslims. And I think that's, I think, the point that Hina was trying to make earlier, which is that there's a methodological flaw in saying that, um, you know, 
the, the fact that every terrorist has, say, a, a strong political philosophy or strong political belief, does that mean that everybody who has that same political belief is going to become a terrorist? It's not predictive because it's not compared to any sample set. But I, there's a lot of questions, so I'm going to... Wait, wait. Oh, wait, so wait, wait, more? People want so to say more. They, okay, they, they get to plug the book. I'll plug our company, uh, the Sufan Group, because we actually just finished doing this study. And Singapore was one of the case studies. It was one of the cities that, that we launched the study. So we are looking at these things. The, the, the problem is, you know, Singapore, for example, has certain laws where they can take somebody in kind of this, uh, this, this limbo detention type thing and hold them and kind of rehabilitate them. We can't do things like that, for example. But that information has been shared with other governments, with, with our own government, with State Department, DHS. So we are actively with, with our partners trying to get people to um, uh, you know, look and read this report and figure out what can be done uh, at, the, at the government level and look at some best, press, best, case, uh, best practices and best cases and that type of thing. So um, I would encourage you to take a look. All right, we're okay. going to do one more, and I'm going to pick. OK. Uh -oh. You <laughs> and the white. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ali Withers. I'm a student at NYU. My question is that during your reporting of the surveillance, did you get any idea of what the NYPD was planning on doing on its years and years of um, file collection and how they were planning to transform them into actual leads? Whoa. Oh, wait, hang on. I want to oh. answer this. OK. For, you can finish me off. <laughs> OK. Um, there was a uh, there was a there was a great saying at the NYPD intelligence division where they said, uh, "This is intel. We don't make cases. We make overtime." Um, <laughs> and you you can finish from there. So, one of the things one of the things we found in these police files is we have many dating back to 2003 and some getting close to 2010, and we found them just spying on people open ended like investigating somebody for like 10 years, right? So one guy is associated with the terrorism enterprise investigation in 2003 with this, uh, with this uh, mosque in Brooklyn. And the, you know, the, the NYPD says he was involved in this or that in 1994, but he was never, never charged with a crime, yet they use him to help open up this terrorism enterprise investigation. So we have files on him. So there's a file on him in 04, there's a file on him in 06, there's a file on him and you know, the cops go and interview him in 2008. And then, uh, and then I, I, lose, I lose visibility into him uh, after 2009, I think. But then in 2013, Ray Kelly puts out a press release Rounded up all these guys for selling uh, Ill, uh, black market baby formula and cigarettes. And lo and behold, this guy's on the list. Like, so is this it? Is this the result of 10 years of investigating somebody to get him on selling illegal cigarettes? And, he, you know, and, and then there was this assertion that they were using them to fund, to fund terrorism, but they were never charged with you raising money from the cigarettes to fund terrorism. So I look at these files and I'm just wondering when, do, when does this stop? You know, how long do you get to investigate somebody um, without making a case? Uh, so. Well, I, I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question, but I hope that you all enjoyed uh, this evening's discussion.